Hi, um, my name is Rob Fletcher. I'm going to be doing the second half of this final slot here, just talking about extending a little bit on what uh, Laura was talking about with spec there and comparing some kind of slightly interesting use cases that we see in other test frameworks and how we can achieve similar things in, in spec. Um, I'm a developer at Netflix. Um, I'm not using Kotlin day to day, although I'd love to be. Um, some of the other guys there are. Um, currently, I'm actually writing a book on Spock, the testing framework for Groovy. I don't know if anyone's actually used that at all. Any, any hands out there? Yeah, one or two people. I know the, dev the original developer is here somewhere tonight. Um, and some of the stuff I'm going to be showing you is, is like some really cool features of Spock and how we can achieve similar things or can't achieve similar things or can do things even better in, in spec. So let's dive in. It kind of covers three areas roughly. So firstly, we're going to look at iterative tests. So Laura showed you the really nice kind of nested BDD structure that you can use with, Spock, um, with spec there. Those two names are going to really, really confuse me over the next 15 minutes. <laughs> Let's just throw stuff if I say the wrong one. Um, and let, so let's look at how we can deal with, with tests that are kind of parameterized like this. So here's a, here's a fairly typical Spock spec where we have something called a where block that's, that has a parameter in it that is driven using this funky left shift syntax from some kind of iterable source of, source of data. So what will happen is this test will execute once per value that gets fed into this variable here. And that value can be used throughout the test. Um, so this is great for doing kind of this kind of property-based testing or anything where you've got a, a specific set of values uh, that, you need to, that you need to cover testing edge cases, that kind of thing. So um, a quick example of how we can handle something similar in spec. This, I love the simplicity of this because it reminds me a lot of Jasmine. I, I, I've done a bunch of front-end work in my time and, and I always liked Jasmine and had never found anything on the JVM that would kind of had a similar kind of structure, but now spec provides me that. Um, so we can simply, inside of our describe block, we can have just a for each iteration and we can, we can have an it or, or a describe or a context or anything or any level of that going on inside of that iteration. And therefore, this, um, this test defined by this it block will be run once per value that's coming through there. And if you look at it in the IDE or on the command line runner, you'll see one separate test output per value. Um, one of the nice things, obviously, when you do that, you'll kind of get the same it every time, which is not ideal. One of the really nice things Spock lets you do is add this unroll annotation onto your test, and then you can refer in the name of the test to those values. And then when your report gets generated or your IDE um, test runner executes, you can see which, if one of those individual ones has failed, you can see which one it was. Um, in spec, this is even easier because you can just use string interpolation in your describe or your it block. Fantastically easy. Um, one of the nice things you can do with spec that you, that you really can't do with Spock, and this is something I bashed my head off trying to do this dumb little diamond cutter, if anyone's familiar with that puzzle. Um, trying to is, is having this nested iteration where you've got one set of tests that need to run at a certain level of of kind of iteration and then some others inside of that. So here we've got, we want to test generating for these different characters, but inside of that we want to verify that, that certain other characters appear in a, in a, in a pattern. Um, so you can nest the it iteration, which is something you just cannot do with that Spock structure that I showed you there, where you've, you've really just got one kind of level of parameterization. Um, one thing Spock does really nicely that spec doesn't do yet, hopefully, this is kind of my first wish list item, is doing tabular data. So instead of, let's just jump back quickly, we have that kind of left shift operator here that we saw. One thing Spock can do is let you define what's called a data table where you have, in, instead of that left shift operator, you can define multiple variables in these column headings and then provide tables of data underneath. And the really cool thing is that IntelliJ will will align those tables properly for you as well. Um, and then you can have like multiple parameters going into your tests. Right now, Spot spec doesn't have an awesome way to do that, I don't think, but I know it's on the, on the kind of to-do list, 
or there's certainly a GitHub issue covering it. So kind of the best you can do right now is do something like, we get away with it here because we've only got two dimensions of data, we can iterate over a map and you know, compose our describe and it blocks um, inside of that. If you've got three or more dimensions, it starts to get a lot trickier, although you can certainly imagine having some kind of data class and iterating over a collection of those. It's doable, but it's not as, as neat as the way you can do it in Spock. So that's kind of iteration. Um, MOX is kind of an inter interesting subject with Kotlin generally and, and Spec particularly um, for a couple of reasons. So let's look at an attempt to make a Spec class use Makito. Um, we have a couple of awkward things here. Firstly, we, we have to do this really clunky Java-like cast because we have generic types on the type we're trying to mock and Kotlin is not, is not aware of that at runtime because the types get erased. So we have to do the cast again inside of our assertion, our verify on the, on, on the Mokito um, mock object. Um, and then, yeah, so we don't, we don't have type inference supported. We, don't, we, we lose all our generic type information. Um, it's kind of unpleasant. And then to top it all off, it just doesn't work anyway because Colin, um, Makito's matches return null, and those will fail at runtime because Kotlin kind of strictly null checks lots of things. Um, so there's no mock framework I'm aware of for, for Kotlin, but there certainly is some Makito support for Kotlin, dis, um, distinctly for Kotlin. So if you add this uh, library to your, to your Gradle build, you get a kind of Kotlin version of those same Makito structures, which is now a whole lot more concise. We've got type inference going on on the mock. So the fact that the, the variable here has got a declared type with a generic type, um, Kotlin's reified generics allow us to figure, figure out what that, what that type is inside of the mock factory there. You don't need to specify the class. You don't lose any of the generic type information. You don't need to cast anything. Inside of the verification block, we've got a receiver defined, so we don't need to say, you know, it dot on the arguments that go into that, that matcher. And we have type inference again, so we don't have to cast this argument. Much, much nicer. And the, um, the matcher itself returns a dummy value, so we, we don't have that nullability problem anymore. Um, so this is a very small library, and it kind of eases the path to using Mokito in, in Kotlin and spec. I would, I would highly recommend you look at that if you're, if you're using any kind of test doubles. Um, TCKs, technology compatibility kits. The idea here is that um, you have multiple implementations of something that all need to conform to a specific type of set of rules. So a simple example would be Java's list. There's array list, there's linked list, there's a whole bunch of different implementations, but they all have to conform to a certain set of rules, like they return things in insertion order. They, you know, some of them allow null, some of them don't, but, um, you know, their, their equals and hash codes are consistent. There's a whole bunch of consistent rules they have to apply. Um, so it's really nice to be able to write tests for those things once and then test all of your implementations against, against um, the same set of tests without having to rewrite them. So if we look at how Spock would handle this, you would typically declare an abstract test class, have some kind of factory method that produces your, um, abstract factory method that produces your class under test, write a bunch of tests that ac access that object, and then you will extend them with concrete classes that simply override that one factory method. They can also add their own tests if there is, is extended, fu extended functionality for that particular implementation. But the idea is that when you execute um, your test suite, all of, the tests, all of the tests defined in this abstract base class run for this subclass and for this subclass and for any others you've got. So very quickly you build up a kind of suite of acceptance tests for an implementation of an interface. Um, now one of the things that's interesting with spec is that the tests themselves are defined in kind of a, almost, you can almost think of it like a static initializer in, in a Java class. So you don't have methods you can override to do this kind of thing. As such, you can define class-level methods in a spec class, but the, but the tests can't see them. 
it can only see things that are in the companion object. And obviously companion objects like Java statics can't have inheritance. Um, so one solution to this is again to use an abstract class that extends the spec base class, but define a property which is, you know, your, uh, I've, I tried to do this with generics and I've forgotten to put the, and then I stopped doing it with generics and I've forgotten to take the generic type out there. So let's assume that as event bus. So define a property that implementations need to provide to the constructor. Then write all your test DSL as normal. Then you can have concrete extensions of that that simply pass a value to that constructor which, are access which is then accessible from within the tests. That's pretty good. Um, as long as you can express your um, the constructing of your class under test in, in a suffi sufficiently concise form that it goes in a constructor like that. If you can't, you probably want to use a factory method of some kind, and a lambda is an obvious solution, so you can instead say, have again an abstract uh, spec that takes a factory function that goes from an empty parameter set to your class under test, then just have a value in there that or each individual test could, could create a new instance if you prefer, but you know, have a value that calls on that factory function, then the extension classes for testing specific implementations just provide that factory function. So here we've got one that uses Kotlin's funky new method reference syntax to reference the constructor of the standard event bus. You can do that if it's a zero arg constructor. And here we've actually, we're actually using a, like a lambda closure um, because it, needs, it has a more complex constructor and some more complex setup going on. And this works great. Um, this gets you around the fact that you can't kind of have a hierarchy of virtual methods in a, in a spec class as such, but you can pass factories and properties to the constructor. Um, this is the big wish, wish list item for me, diagrammed assertions. Has anyone ever used Scala test with the diagrammed assertions? Trait or Spock or Gro even Groovy's assert keyword has this, has this now. Um, it's a very cool feature for, and you know, Hamcrest was a was it really an attempt to solve this problem in Java um, some years ago. The problem is with Hamcrest that if anyone's ever tried to write their own Hamcrest matcher, it's kind of it's slightly time consuming, and it's a slightly obtuse API. I find it's very good, but you know, it's bounded by what Java can achieve really. Um, if we look at, at this, this is a feature that was introduced by Spock and later adopted by the Groovy language as a whole using its assert keyword. So in Spock, if you have a kind of, an inside of an expect block in Spock, I should explain, any, anything that can be evaluated as Boolean is treated as, a, as an assertion. So this is an assertion. Um, if that assertion fails, Spock gives us some really fantastic output that looks like this, where every kind of step in that, in that expression on both sides of the, of the, binary, um, the binary operator, although you can't see that here, is, is broken down and you can see each individual object, you know, you can figure out what was going on. So it's like, if it's like, if you're scratching your head looking at this thinking, well, why is the name wrong? Was it the wrong user? Was it the wrong order? It's, it, it can be hard to tell until you see this awesome diagram breakdown where um, it's per, you know, it can really help clarify things as long as you have good two-string implementations on stuff generally. Um, it's even, Spock's uh, implementation of this is even so neat that if something kind of two strings the same but doesn't evaluate as equals, it'll point that out. So if you've got like a string with the number one in it compared to an integer one and they don't compare equals although they print the same, it'll point out to you that actually the reason it's failing is the types are different. And this power assert uh, feature was adopted by the Groovy language as a whole, so Groovy's assert keyword does this by default. Um, Scala test also has a trait you can implement that gives you a similar, a similar um, set of functionality, a similar feature. And this is like the number one thing I would love to see added to spec because it, you know, I, I've written Spock tests for many years now and 
and living without this would be kind of the, one of the harder things I would have to do. So um, much as I love spec, that's kind of the number one thing that's missing right now for me. Um, so if anyone has any bright ideas on how we can do that, in fact, um, John Schneider, who's at the back, one of the Netflix guys, is working on a, a kind of way to implement this generically in the JVM using compiler, annota uh, compiler annotation processing. Um, and he thinks he can get it working for Java, which I'll be really, really impressed by if he can. And he's nodding his head at me, so he's, uh, he's very confident, apparently. So if you're interested, go speak to John, who's up the back. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I wanted to cover today, just a quick run through of some of the interesting things you can do with spec. Um, and then to remind everyone, please attend the next Kotlin uh, user group in the Bay Area here, which is going to be hosted at Netflix on May 26th, where we're going to have the, some of the guys from the engineering tools team at, at Netflix talking about Spring Cloud extensions for Kotlin. Okay, thanks very much.